great. Uh, what we're going to do now is have sort of a, an open panel about common practices in flight software and common flight software. And um, we have four panelists. This is Mike Phillips from Lockheed Martin, Dr. Catherine Weiss from NASA JPL, Mark Reed from APL, and Dave McComas from Goddard? Goddard. I got it right. Okay. Now, each of them uh, have a little uh, presentation after a fashion, and I'm just going to go in order. I is that okay? And then yours is easy because it's a, it's a film. Right, and then you guys can just kind of talk to it as we go. Is that all right? Why don't you hold this? <coughs> Maybe you'll want to sit in the chair when you do it. Now, I will, I will tell you guys, uh, what will be recorded is audio only, uh, unless we put something on the screen, then that is recorded. Okay. I'm going to start off with the uh, short video that I have, about a minute and a half, and then I'll talk to you for another minute and introduce myself. Lockheed Martin has actually been building satellites for the past 50 years, and we've launched over 150 successful small satellites. We've participated in a number of programs. Some recent ones have been XSS-11, the GRAIL program, the Phoenix program also for NASA, um, Iridium, which was done as a commercial entity, and we go across the customer sets from NASA to the DOD to the intelligence community. What we're seeing is we're looking at all the current architectures in, in space, including military communications, overhead persistent infrared, uh, looking at the precision navigation and timing, and then as a part of that, looking at the space situational awareness and space protection. We're trying to merge those architectures to understand the next generation of satellites. What's the best, most cost-effective way to ensure that we have the needs we get from space? Right now, we're looking at ways to do our missions more affordably. So we have m several core main programs like SIBRS, GPS, AEHF. And we're looking at small sats and hosted payloads as a way to augment those programs and those systems to give the customer more capability or more resilient capability at a more affordable price. So one of the things we can do is test out new payloads or new capabilities before you commit to those on your main programs. And so small satellites gives you the chance to do that quickly and easily. And it looks to me like the future will include core programs like we have augmented by things like small satellites or hosted payloads to try to give us more resilience and more capability at a lower price. Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company isn't really about building big satellites or building small satellites. It's really about getting the right capabilities to space for the best price possible for our customers. Okay, thanks. I'm Michael Phillips from Lockheed Martin. I work in the um, Software Engineering Directorate uh, for Space Systems Company, and we have several distributed sites that I'll be talking about um, with our focus on commonality. Um, but my focus area, at least in the common areas, is what you saw up there. Um, the opportunities in, in small sats, cube sats, uh, for the demonstrating the next generation of uh, national asset systems that we might put up in 2020 to 2030 and Lockheed's push to do a lot more commercially and internationally. So that's the focus area that we have, at least in the area of commonality. Okay. I actually didn't prepare any slides. Um, I have my keynote slides from last year, which, you know, don't even bother opening them. I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes, and then we can move on, because I think everybody here wants to get to the question and answer part of this anyway. Um, my name is Katie Weiss. I am a uh, senior flight software engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I am in the flight software and avionics section, and I'm also the cognizant engineer for something we like to call flight software core. Flight software core is JPL's next generation flight software platform, and it is meant to be the future for flight software at JPL. In other words, all future missions will pull from this flight software product line from a set of core assets t in order to assemble a flight software system. So we're moving away from creating these large monolithic releases of flight software that are cloned and owned from mission to mission, and we're moving toward a paradigm where we're actually creating a software product line where we have reusable components, 
a reusable architectural framework, re a reference architecture, and then um, using those core assets to assemble new flight software systems. Um, and so it's a, it's a big paradigm shift for JPL, moving away from the project owning the flight software to actually having the line organization own the flight software and manage this core asset base. Um, so hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit more about that um, in the question and answer section. Hi, I'm Dave Vacomis from Goddard Space Flight Center. Did you want me to? I did prepare a couple slides, but most of this, and I'm not. I'm going to be brief as well, um, I, so I could get it cleared within a week. Um, most of these slides are just from a presentation in the 2012 Flight Software Workshop. So real quick, Goddard has everything philosophically that Dr. We, we said um, is identical what has Goddard has been doing, um, because we kind of recognized that we had one was driven by schedules and budget. So we um, we um, actually actually had internal reorg. And that's when we had people from different areas of Goddard come together and we realized we we're doing a lot of the same thing. So flight software is distributed. We did a clone and own. So um, we started putting our heads together and um, we came up with a layered architecture and we did a heritage analysis, which um, we were able to, we didn't have an ideal situation. Everything at Goddard's project funded. So we had to nickel and dime this effort. It really was a grassroots effort. There's things we would have done differently if we could have just gotten a big budget and work it top down and bottom up. But you know, a lot of it was done in the context of projects on the side, and we kept evolving this um, product line. So the heritage analysis, we didn't get it done in everything we wanted to, but we did get some done, so we were able to get some variability and commonality, and we could identify those points and try to make them configurable when you deploy the system or during runtime. And real quick, the reason I wanted to put this slide together, we actually had, so this was, and I don't have the timelines in the backup, but um, so CFE, it's a layered architecture. Core Flight Exec is the layer that provides an application interface so we can have like an app store, so an app repository. And so the CFE has now become, um, gotten popular. We, get, we were able to get it open source a couple of years ago, maybe it was four years ago, and that way Johnson picked up on it and Ames used it for the LADI mission and um, Glenn has it. Many people have it and so we've been trying to get a community together and we just had our first, well actually there was one last year, it was things weren't as mature then, but this year at Glenn we just had a, two weeks ago we had a workshop and it was attended by, you know, we had really good representation across the agency and we um, now are establishing a uh, a community plan and we're gonna have a CCB that's gonna be NASA wide that's gonna control this as a product line so we're taking the next step where we, we've had to grow again line management owns the CFE and now we're, we're giving control up to a NASA wide CCB to own the product and this is as of two weeks ago so that's a you know definitely a paradigm shift for us and we're gonna establish a community using github and and the Ames repository, and we're trying to still work out some of the legal and the logistics of all this. And uh, I'm not going to go, again, we got the question and answer. So basically, here's a, there's some artifacts. There's been a lot of recent developments at the other centers that we're trying to bring together. And I think that's all I'm going to speak to, so I don't go on either. <laughs> Too long. Do you have slides? Okay, I'm uh, Mark Reed. I'm um, section supervisor for the flight software architecture section at, uh, at APL. And um, I, d I only have three quick slides as well. Um, the work we've done, we've really piggybacked on the core flight executive from NASA Goddard. And um, I just wanted to give you sort of a, a brief flavor of what we went through, um, just with three charts. I know that's hard to do. But um, we started an effort about eight to ten years ago uh, looking at going from our heritage monolithic uh, flight software architecture to a more um, message-based, uh, plug-and-play, if you want to call it, uh, component-based, um, application-based, you know, all the buzzwords, uh, layered architecture. So um, this was presented at a, um, 
a conference back in 07, so that tells you at least it was seven or eight years ago uh, that we started on this. So we were at that point prototyping using an early version of CFE, so we had like version 3 dot something, if I remember correctly, and we did a prototype um, uh, applications using the messaging services, core services, and OS abstraction uh, at that point. Um, so you could see the difference in these two architectures is you're going from an architecture which was our legacy was more monolithic with packages where functions would call other functions and you get this uh, sort of uh, coupling effect of the spider web of coupling between your packages versus uh, more layered architecture. Um, so then we took that prototype and moved it forward on a mission and our first project to use this was the Van Allen probes. Um, also known as RBSP. Um, we took a lot of heritage code from Stereo, Messenger, New Horizons, uh, other APL miss missions, and we packaged it into applications that basically transferred data through the software bus, the CFE software bus, using their API. And we used their executive services, um, um, the software bus messaging services, time services. The only thing we did not take out of CFE or we didn't use was their uh, table services for managing our onboard data. Uh, we wanted to stick with our heritage way of managing our uh, uploads and downloads of our, our tables, or as we called them, memory objects. So we ended up with an architecture. This is, um, again, from about 2010. Um, this is RBSP, you can see, layered up down to, in our case, we had the compact PCI interface to a RAT 750 um, with our solid state recorder and our various spacecraft interfaces. But from an application perspective, the developers developing the, the circles at the top, right? Everything below that is provided by CFE in the operating system and down, board support packages, et cetera. And then sort of the last thing we did, um, in order to develop those applications, we created what we call an application framework. And it's um, a way that we can deploy a common code into each application without uh, having 20 developers develop code 20 different ways. So we created an application template and sort of a wizard uh, way of then deploying that template. So um, we have common code that's in packages that you don't touch, and that's things like we call it our app main, and that has uh, code that's untouched by developers. We develop it once, deploy it to all applications in the system. So if we had, in the case of our VSP, we had 17 applications. They all 17 got that same uh, instantiation of that common code. And then there's specific code, which are packages that we deploy a framework and the developers then get to modify that code only. And then they can put any other packages they want to bring in. Yeah. So that's really the context of how we've tried to uh, deploy sort of our common code on top of uh, CFE. So we can use it common across missions. So that's, I guess, what common means to me. So that's all I have. Uh, you know, we learn process so fast. <laughs> uh, so how do you handle updates to the common code? So I can imagine that at different points in the, you're, you're not just going to leave the common code alone forever. You'll find issues, you'll fix things, you'll improve things. Um, if a project is far along, how do you decide what pushes when and who decides that? How? Whoever answers has to have a microphone. That's the other process. Can I start with you? Sure. Um, <laughs> I guess I just experienced this on GPM, um, which just launched in March. Uh, I mean, the CFE and the CFE, the CF, sorry, there's a nomenclature, core flight system, we just refer to all the software. And unfortunately, I didn't put up my layered architecture. But um, so the apps are also CM'd individually. And what we did, the, our build system lets us, um, put in local patches in the build system so we can override things on a project level. So it really depends on the point you are in the project and where you are in your testing. But it does let you do local changes. But it has been a, you know, it's been a challenge because then you got the local change you want to feed back into the product line. And when everybody's really busy going through INT and launch, it, it you know, it, there, we do have a backfill because um, 
we actually have the next project at Goddard that wanted to do the clone and own because they said, well, wait a minute, this, you, we haven't gotten through the life cycle yet of putting this back in the library. And, and without that project independent funding, we're, we're, it's, it's being challenged. And that's one of the motivations to go to a community so we can leverage the work across the other centers because they're making updates as well. So did, I hope that answered it. Thanks. I guess for the, the one example I would give is, you know, in our application framework, we have the, from the diagram, the blue packages and the orange packages. So the things that are in blue, we don't expect, you know, and, and that, um, you know, our, our app main packages, we don't expect developers to touch. But if you were to find a bug in that package, right, now you have to deploy that to every application in the system if you want to fix it, right? It's, it's not in one place, it's in 20 places, right? So as long as it's in that package that the developer hasn't touched, we can just redeploy that package and rebuild. If it's in packages where, you know, the, the app specific area and we find an issue and we need to redeploy that piece of the framework, now you have a merge process that developers, you have to kind of merge back in changes. So I agree that that can be an issue. Um, I'm going to take a little bit different take on this, and that is that I think that's one of the benefits of having the line organization on the product line as opposed to having the project on the product line. So if you imagine a situation where the flight software core at JPL, the, the basically the C&DH component, has, an, has a bug, you found a bug in it on a project, um, it becomes very uh, difficult to make sure that that change goes across to another project and is updated in a similar and safe way, right? Whereas if you have the line organization owning that flight software core package, you make one update and then deploy it to the projects that want that update, right? So um, I think from, uh, it's really a management um, decision whether or not a certain project will actually take a change, but what makes that a possible what makes that a possibility is the fact that the line organization owns the product line. So Lockheed's programs are large and pretty distributed across our sites with, uh, again, the uh, projects themselves are um, stood up their own baseline. And so as we move toward a, uh, what we've been calling standard product approach and we decide what engineering software products can be produced centrally and distributed to programs, we would use the same approach, uh, product line approach, product line engineering with uh, core assets controlled by a central organization, you know, configuration control boards so that we could do those updates and we could uh, have technology ro refresh roadmaps that would allow us to tell our end users when new updates would be coming out and then we'd um, Essentially, that central line organization would own uh, knowledge of if there's defects discovered to communicate, you know, uh, in some fashion with the users and, and have them uh, take ownership of an update if that's necessary. So, okay. No kidding. So I guess the other part of that um, would be how do you think it affects innovation and change? Does it make it way harder to improve this system? Because you have to have so many, it seems like now you've got customers, you've got the people who manage the core and then everyone else is your customer and um, you make a change and then all of a sudden some of them are happy and some of them are really unhappy. So basically think of Windows, right? Think of, no, it's not bad, it's not a bad analogy. Think of Windows, think of your iOS on your iPhone, think of um, VxWorks, right? When they have a new version that comes out, the customer makes a decision, do I want that new version or not? I think having a product line approach to developing flight software actually, um, it, it, it creates a platform for innovation because you're constantly looking forward and doing technology forecasting and what is the direction this product line is going to take. And as you increment your versions, now it's up to the project to decide, yeah, I want to use Windows 8 instead of Windows 7. You know, you can make that decision. It really is a, is a uh, it, it fosters innovation. I would also say another, another way that it fosters innovation is that from a project um, lead, if you're developing the flight software, you don't have to worry about a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the common capabilities that you're getting, you know, from the, from the um, you know, this product line, common software. You get a focus on the applications. That's really where all the, you know, all the innovation is, right? You're not spending your effort and your time on things, the, 
the pieces that are just you know making the day-to-day -day moving of the bits. So, so this seems very. It seems like you're progressing towards the model that uh, the multi-mission ground system and service are doing, where they're doing. We can't turn the mic off, and we have to speak to the. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. So it seems like you're following, or you're p going towards the model that the multi-mission ground systems and services are doing for um, Amos, where they are releasing something every six months, a uh, common core set of capabilities, and then there might be something specific for uh, service for a particular mission. Uh, where, but they have an infrastructure already set up to release new updates uh, on a scheduled basis. And then the project decides whether or not they like that new update and then skips that particular version and stays with their version or might wait for the next thir three or four versions down when you list this is what we're going to work on on version five or six or whatever. Is that what you want to go towards? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we want to go towards. And again, it's kind of with the innovation question. I mean, because we don't, it's really a, ser you're providing a service and an infrastructure. So if that stays stable, it provides a platform for all the innovation. Um, and sorry, I, I want to get back to the first question, just to clarify a little bit. I mean, I think we have a funding cha difference between like JPL and Goddard. We don't, our line management doesn't get much money. So we're, we're looking at challenges. So we don't get the fund when I say the line management took over the, uh, it's, that's one of our challenges to keep the CFE going because we basically can tax projects. The other area we're looking at, again, we have the community we're establishing that will help it. But we also have a lot of low earth orbiting satellites that we have a sustaining engineering group. So that might be a way that we're looking to possibly, not as mature, help let them help. And that's another area, I guess, from a life cycle perspective, at least with low earth missions, that they're really enjoying that benefit of getting a common architecture. Because right now they maintain over 10, it's in the 10 to 20 range, and they're all different platforms they gotta learn. So this team has gotta know a lot of different platforms to maintain the software. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have four topics, so uh, I'd just like to throw them out, and if you could comment on this. Um, what services are provided in this common framework or frameworks for resource management and budgeting? So that's one. Uh, uh, services for multi-level security, isolation, things that aerospace folks might be interested in. Um, and uh, services or tools for end-to-end -end analysis of an application architecture. So, you know, what is a stimulus to response, worst case delay, if uh, the events have to flow through from sensors to actuators within a, you know, a larger system. And finally, it seems that uh, a lot of these frameworks uh, act as kind of application platforms. So are you thinking about or planning for in-flight application updates? So these are four topics, and you know, I just well, have to throw them out. Do you, do you start with yeah. Monica's? So um, actually, I think every topic that you just mentioned is really an architectural question. Um, I think that basically what we have done, I'm, I'm only going to speak for the JPL Flight Software Core, is that when, when I talk about the JPL Flight Software product line, I'm not merely talking about the core component. What I'm actually talking about is a reference architecture for building a flight software system based on that architecture. So when you talk about uh, things like up, uploading new software on the fly, that's an architectural question. The JPL flight software architecture actually supports uploading new components um, on the fly. Uh, you talk about doing formal analysis and, and whatnot. Again, um, architectural models of your flight software architecture will allow you to do that type of latency analysis, jitter analysis. You talk about multi-level security, you could also talk about safety. Another architectural question, which really comes down to, are you using um, uh, things like space and time partitioning in order to, um, 
in order to ensure that you meet security and safety and reliability requirements. So all of those topics, um, in my mind, really come down to architecture. And have you architected your system prop properly in order to achieve the properties that you want to see out of your system? I think that at, uh, in terms of the JPL flight software product line, um, we definitely have done that. We have a very rigorous architecture um, with uh, architectural principles and constraints that constrain application developers, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, in ways that I don't think CFE, CFS does. We actually have a, a formal definition of what a component is, what a connector is, and in when you build your uh, flight software system, you have to follow those architectural principles and constraints in order to interact with the flight software core. So it's a very strict architecture on the flight software system as a whole, and I think because of that, we actually are able to give, deliver some of the properties that you're, that you're suggesting. Yeah, so I'll touch on a point or two. Um, we also are looking at different reference architectures. I think the problem that might come up in the future is the trade space is fairly wide with respect to the architectural solutions and uh, that we need to do so if we're really focusing on affordability you know we really need to neck down you know we talked about maybe partition operating systems which we just flew on our Orion system um, we have such different uh, mission needs from our customers right they drive different architectural choices so the real concern maybe is as we move forward with common products and standard products that variation could get worse in the future before it gets better so somehow necking it down to constrain the problem somewhat with all the choices that are open to us and and um, working with programs to allow that to happen in a common way is something we're looking at um, maybe a question about the uh, so we're talking a lot about the product itself um, but obviously that's just part of the problem you can have a superior product that you deliver to your internal customers for use, but they have to know how to use it in a series of documentation. There's training. We found that marrying the people with the product itself is critical. Um, our, our high reuse programs have really uh, been able to leverage the people with the product as they move from program to program. So we have to have a training program in place, a documentation and program in place, a way to deploy, you know, the central standard product as teams get started with that. So. Um, you know, with respect to affordability, it's really the productivity of the team itself, um, and just the product is only one part of that. Well, and I also think it's important to note that exactly what you just said is that core assets are not just pieces of software. Core assets in a flight software product line are people, process, training, tool sets, infrastructure, build systems. It all, it's all inclusive. It's not just about the actual reuse of the code itself. 90% of your reuse is actually going to be from all that other stuff, right? It's the infrastructure. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to resonate with you on. It, it, that really is an important key. The other thing is that um, you mentioned keeping the people with the product, and that's exactly what we've done at JPL in the flight software section. We actually have a flight software core group that works on the flight software core. So you're maintaining that knowledge base from project to project by keeping it with um, the people. I guess the couple of points, and this is just my experience with you know, as a as a user or a, an end user for CFE, um, it, um, the CFE architecture, similar to uh, some of the points that Katie was hitting on, um, it, it supports um, being able to do uploads of individual components, so you can add components or modify components without reloading the entire system the way it's uh, been, you know, um, architected. Um, and I, I do agree that there's no enforcement of the way that um, a developer chooses. Um, a developer could choose within his application to do a call directly into the OS, right? You could choose that. There's nothing that prevents it within the architecture other than, you know, good practices. So it, it is an educational um, and documenting things to say, if you're developing for CFE, you have to use the API. You don't, you know, don't go around it. Don't, don't try to write directly to hardware. Don't try to, you know, make direct calls to the OS. You know, these, these API is there for a reason. Right, and, and that documentation, that knowledge base, that training has to be provided as well. Oh, actually, can I follow up on that? Because there's a lot of topics flowing in my head. Um, hopefully I'll remember them. To reemphasize the whole total product, I mean, all the artifacts. I mean, one of the goals of the CFE 
and CFS was to deliver tests as well. I mean, that was a big change because every time we did, quote, reuse in the past, the project managers would say, well, you had 20% here, 60% here, and your budget's the same, you know, same percentage. So you didn't really save anything. So we, we deliver, you know, it's deliver with unit tests and um, build tests. And, and then we're learning too. And again, it was a homegrown product. And uh, so we delivered build tests that those are functional requirement tests, but they run on our ground system. So as we expand the community, we're running into challenges of how to even deliver apps with a build level test script. And we explored some options at the workshop that I think will hopefully pay off. And I guess back to your original question with some of the resources. Yeah, we didn't, I mean, part of this is the history of CFE. It was, you know, it was a grassroots, so we, LRO was ready to go, and so we got the CFE running. So none of the apps were reusable at that point. So we were kind of, um, I mean, we do have a CFE team, but it's funded very sporadically. <laughs> so it, it, it ebbs and flows with the funding that we can get. So we didn't, ideally we would have loved to have a top-down architecture with the rules and the constraints built in, but we don't have that. So a lot of it is, as Mark said, is, um, you know, user base, but still there's areas we want to, so we put some tools in to help us. We have a performance monitor tool and we have hooks into the executive that then let you dump things on the ground and then do post analysis. But there's nothing when you deploy the system that you can get deterministic, you know, you say I set my scheduler up this way. We still have to, you got to tune your priorities, you got to kind of balance the system after you first deploy it and it's a manual process. And it's an area we'd love to, you know, increase on and that's how we're doing it is incremental improvements. Um, hello, can you hear me? Oh. All of the people. Uh, it is, I think it's on, I just can't hear myself. Um, so I, I have two questions, I'm not sure if I'm going to get a chance to ask both. One has to do with uh, requirements and documentation, the other one has to do with configuration management. But the first question is, um, if you can speak a bit to um, how you're doing your documentation and requirements and your qualification as far as are you are you writing multiple SRSs where, where one is targeting your core software and then each program develops their own such that it, it, they're, they're um, unique between the two? Or, or is each program developing uh, their own set of requirements that overlap with the other programs? Um, and then qualification the same way. Are you able to leverage on your program a qualification that you ran on the core software? Or are you rerunning the qualification of all your requirements on your built software for each program? Um, I, I guess I can. I got the mic. Um, <laughs> uh, yes and yes, I think. <laughs> so the core flight system has its own set of requirements, and then each app ha also has, um, we actually wrote what we call subsystem level and then detailed requirements. And so our goal is, so the mission, mi new mission can take the subsystem level requirements and put them in their, depends on the leveling of the project, but um, I'll call them subsystem requirements, or flight software subsystem. And then what we did was, um, we parameterize the requirements for the variability. And variability points are sometimes are design level and some are requirements driven. So it depends on the point. But then our build test as well can ingest the header files that do the variability and they can be rerun using the tuned parameters from the, um, that a mission decides to use. So they don't rewrite any, pr so for an application X, they don't, they don't rewrite any requirements. They just say, here's the configuration header file, and that serves as the instantiation of the requirements, if that makes sense. So internally, it works for Goddard, because we use the ground system we have. That was for your qualification, you're saying? So for, yeah. for your qualification scripts, are pulling in the header files from your software, and then yeah. using the parameters in there to... To help tune the, the build test script. So they, that, that's all automated? There's no... That's way. automated, yeah. But again, if you use our ground system, and we're looking at other options right now, I mean, since the community is expanding. <clears throat> well, I can just speak from the experience I had on uh, RBSP, or the Van Allen probes, going forward into Solar Probe. So when we wrote the um, flight software requirements for RBSP, we, at the flight software level, then allocated down to components. So I would allocate a flight software requirement, for instance, to our command ingest component if it were an uplink related requirement or to our playback re you know, component if it was related to our solid state recorder playing back of data. So of our 17 apps, we allocated the requirements down to those. And then we also would allocate requirements to the CFE if those were being met by that um, CFE that we were taking from Goddard. Right? So then going forward into Solar Probe, 
the reusable applications, whichever component they were reusing, they could take those requirements that were allocated to that component and move them to the next mission, right? And there is tuning that has to happen. So, for instance, the downlink rates are going to be different on Solar Probe. So the downlink requirements may change, but those requirements allocated to those components kind of move forward, if that makes sense. And then for that, so our, our verification of the requirements is sort of at that component level, but we do sort of thread-based end-to-end testing to do that verification. And for that integrated system testing, though, are you able to, you're, you're developing and, and rerunning it for each program, or you're able to leverage the qualification that was done on this, just the CFE? Um, we are able to leverage, and it, it goes back to what Dave was saying, I guess, and in their case, they're using a different ground system than us, but we have scripts that were written for a ground system that we use at APL, and those same scripts will be moved forward. It's the same command and telemetry a database effectively for those components can move forward for the next mission. So we are able to leverage that uh, same set of basically regression test scripts by the time we get to the end of one mission become your initial test scripts for the next mission. So <clears throat> in the flight software core we actually have requirement level four, five, and six requirements on the flight software core component itself and the intention is that the um, the core is fully unit tested against those requirements and that entire package is then delivered to a project. So a project inherits both the core component requirements as well as the unit tests that demonstrate that it, they meet those requirements. Embedded in those requirements are your variation points. Those variation points, similar to what Dave said, translate into configuration header files for each module internal to the core component. We, unlike Goddard, do not automatically um, populate from the requirements into the flight software core. The requirements have to be manually changed and then the configuration header files manually changed to update to those requirements. But the intention is that the core is, is a self-contained uh, piece of software that's, that's essentially qualified against the requirements written against it and then inherited by a project. And then the project writes requirements, level three, level four requirements on the flight software system within which the flight software core component exists. So it's very, it's almost identical to CFE. Yeah, I just want to clarify why I'll say. Yeah, so I didn't want to mislead. Um, our, our, our header file is configured and then ingested into the test scripts, but we don't change all the, we don't do anything with the requirements. That traceability, it's traced, that's why I want to, it's traced, on GPM what we did was CM the head, configured header file and say this is our instantiation of the requirements. So it's not a full trace through the requirements document. They just kind of stay as they are. And then it's the header file. I just want, want to clarify that so it's not, it's not as, no, I, I wish it were all the way. <laughs> well, it would be cool. I, we're only half there. <laughs> So I've been watching the proliferation of CFE and CFS since I started coming to these conferences in 2009. Um, so Lockheed this year had an R&D project to um, start using CFE and CFS, well actually when CFS gets released, open source. <laughs> um, but to at least leverage the CFE code in our standard product is a central thing. So we've pulled really their level requirements from the um, SRS level and down to the detailed level. We pulled their unit tests and run them. So the plan would be centrally, right, to qualify that that end product that's delivered to our internal customer with a series of requirements. So we essentially qualify a subset of it, call it a CSCI or something that would have the core executive capability that's in CFE built out, and you'd have those interviews with the customers to understand whether they needed that functionality or not, and you'd tailor the software requirements spec, and then you'd specifically test to there. Getting back to your question about you ought to be able to, if, if a new customer needs that same capability, they can leverage off a previously qualified capability, therefore saving them the cost of putting those requirements into their uh, end software requirements spec. So I'll take a quick stab at that. Um, 
So we are defining uh, something called common services. So think of it as that, that core capability that probably exists in all of our you know, small satellites, hosted payloads, and large systems that's common. Um, our next level up is um, what we call catalog items, and we're doing configure to order or catalog to order, where you'd actually, as you build up your reference architectures for a particular mission, a NASA interplanetary mission versus a geosynchronous versus a agile LEO vehicle, right, that you'd have these reference architectures built with configurability into that capability. So, um, yeah, you leverage those. Um, basically, those reference architectures would allow you to um, specifically state those requirements and capabilities for that. So I think it's, we're really starting with very small. I think as you build up to the um, higher level mission applications, which we're not doing, so as a central organization, we'd own that standard product, but the program would, Sorry, the program would really add the mission unique capability that would actually define those particular needs. My answer is really simple. We have an architecture description document that basically states the classes of missions that we're, we plan on supporting. And then we have minimum system requirements that basically say, the, in order for you to run Flight Software Core, you need to have this minimum system requirements. And then in addition to that, we have a listing. Um, so we have the architecture, the overall architecture, and then the architecture of the core that lists all the core capabilities. So if you need the core capabilities and you have the minimum system requirements, then you can fly our software. Yeah, I wish how many times people have asked us for that and we don't have, we don't have it well documented. And one of the things on our list would be, we'd love to also have benchmarks, but we don't have a, a minimum set or a range that we really publish, and that's something we'd love to be able to do. But at the same, it, it, it's a push and pull kind of thing, though, because at the same time, we've got some CubeSat work going on now, and now, and then there's been talk of a micro CFE, but then you got this whole trade-off of all the resources that are required. Do you meet the full API or part of it? And then, so then, then, but then somebody put the effort in. Alan Cudmore just rehosted it to the free RTOS, which has a very low requirement, you know, in terms of our runtime system. So it depends which way you push your energy. And now, now he's expanded the platforms. Again, not from a memory or CPU run, you know, there's still other issues and resources. Within the core as they exist now and the requirements you have, what capabilities are there for resilience to a cyber attack? And I'm going to assume the answer is very little, <laughs> but are there plans on the roadmap for when, when someone finally says, okay, I'm going to need encrypted communication to the ground system, I'm going to need integrity checks, I'm going to need some kind of key management, what's the, the current state of the common efforts? Uh, the, the CFS right now, the command ingest and telemetry output are not part of it. So that's a, each um, user pr provides their own command. So we don't actually, we don't have any built-in security right now, but that's the way when we're not going to release those two apps for that reason. I mean, so we do, like on GPM, we do have command key management. And, and, and nobody has done encryption right, that I'm aware of. But um, So, no, it's, the answer the, the, at the core level, no, that's not addressed. And what's that? Okay. <laughs> Hi. So, the JPL core actually does include t command and telemetry, um, so it would definitely be uh, changed to the the flight software core if you were to add security encryption protections. Um, it's not really in our baseline right now, but I mean, if there if we felt that there was a need for it to expand in that direction, we certainly certainly could. So, um, well, we use the coding standards that are, you know, uh, required at JPL, but they really don't have any security requirements on flight software per se, so not right now. So this is a follow-up question specifically for the JPL. Um, I know every single project is supposed to have a flight protection plan. Um, the core flight software project uh, is not uh, considered a project per se, a flight project per se. It just feeds into project. So are you going to take a look at the various different uh, flight project protection plans to see a commonality that the core needs to meet so that you could give it to the projects later on so that the projects doesn't have to do it to cover those 
type of things that uh, is required for the projects? Like, can you give me an example? Um, in, in the project uh, protection plan, there's things um, in, in terms of encryption, in terms of uh, protection, in terms of uh, just doing static code analysis. There's certain checkers that you would run uh, checking for some of these cybersecurity threats. Um, I figure the project will have to do that, uh, but it would help the project if you guys actually start. Right. No, th and that's, I mean, that's basically the same answer that, um, that I just said is that we, we aren't doing that right now. We, we, it's not part of our baseline for the core. We basically took the um, Mars Science Laboratory CNDH software and we ported it and massaged it into this new architecture, refactored the code, rewrote several pieces of um, the code actually, and um, that's where we stand today. So any new security or protection requirements that need to be levied, you know, we should talk about that because if it's something that needs to be in, as par a part of the flight software core, we need to start thinking about it now um, because we don't currently have that in our baseline. Uh, my question uh, also has relates to security, but more so uh, uh, coding standards and practices. So a couple of years ago, uh, Dr. David Ward spoke at this workshop, and he's uh, over. He leads the MISRA standard, which is used in the autom automotive industry. At JPL, we adopted the MISRA standard and tailored it to our needs. And I just want to get your opinion on how co what coding standards your organizations use, and what benefits uh, you have seen from the adoption of these coding practices. And this points to the question of sort of writing safe and secure code that was sort of raised a little bit uh, just a few minutes ago. So I have, I have the mic, so I'll answer. But I'm going to answer from with my MSL flight software hat on as opposed to my flight software core hat on. Um, the coding standards and the coding guidelines that we followed on MSL actually had a huge impact on our code, the quality of the code that we produced. Um, we had a very high assertion density in our code, um, which led to, you know, a very uh, reliable code, code base, um, as obviously, I mean, we've uh, had ran into very few flight software bugs um, on board MSL in the, you know, three years that it's been flying two years on the surface, one year transit. Um, what did we follow? We used um, Scrub, which is a tool internal to JPL, which is actually a collection of static code checkers, including Coverity, um, Smell, um, the Power of 10, Gerard Holtzman's um, uh, coding standards. We also followed an implementation checklist, which was extremely thorough. It had something like, it had almost like 200 items in the implementation standard that every developer had to go through their module and verify as well as their peer. We conducted um, peer reviews of every line of code, every line of handwritten code on uh, board the spacecraft. We um, achieved almost 100% unit test coverage, and this was all part of the process that went into making making the MSL code as reliable and as defect-free as it is, knock on wood. Um, so I think that it has a tremendous impact on the quality of flight software that you write, so I definitely think it's worth it. So we have a lot of large programs that have a historical code baseline and, and reuse that, um, but in the last several years, we've also embraced static code analysis and the uh, code, code checking standards uh, based on MISRA C, MISRA C++, and using them to automate the process. We have a bunch of large programs going from one language to another, ADA to C++ or C to C++, and those are perfect opportunities to use automatic code checking standards to enforce that consistency as opposed to relying on, you know, peer reviews and individuals looking at lines of code to enforce that. It's also allowed the people to be better software developers and come up to speed on some of that and more consistency in the code as you move to a smaller workforce and you have a, a smaller maintenance crew than you did in development. Yeah, 
couple questions here. You, at the, on the end, I can't remember your name, right here. Um, you mentioned CubeSat, which are becoming more and more popular. How tailorable is your system to use um, these cores on something that is so simple and so small, one. Second, IVMV, when you have these big projects, your code at times needs to be sent to West Virginia. Since you have this common core that's there, is that subject to IVMV or only the, the part that the, the specific mission has to, to write? Um, I'll start with IVMV. Uh, they're kind of structured, I think, funding-wise similar to us, so they do their analysis based on projects. But the nice thing is, is CFE was used on MMS and GPM, so they did static code analysis of the CFE and the apps, actually, for um, GPM. So it has been through IV and V, but it's not on a regular, we've talked to them about, is there a way, a different model we can set up so they can, um, you know, continuously do it on a separate product line, but we haven't really gotten there yet from a funding. And I just lost. The first question was... What? CubeSat. Oh, Tailoring. CubeSat. Oh, right. Um, we're just getting experience there. And as I mentioned, the one that is... Um, we did end up re-hosting the CFE. And uh, we're, we're in the process now, is all I can say, really, is that it's been hosted on an f- uh, operating system called FreeRTOS, which... Um, but again... And, and there was another effort at Goddard where he said he's just not going to use it and he's going to go off his own way because he didn't want to use the process of resources. It gets back to that minimal um, platform, which we couldn't, we, can't, we couldn't guarantee it, so he took his own direction, which is fine. That's a trade, I guess. <laughs> yes, uh, two questions that are related. Uh, I see that you have been talking about common software architecture, but formation that you are actually developing internally, if I understand correctly. So uh, what is your relationship or your usage of common software with industry that are actually developing your mission for you? So when you are not developing the mission by yourself, are you able to enforce the use of this common software or do you have to rely on the software that is heritage of the industry that is actually working with you? And secondly, how much there is an effort to harmonize the software between your different centers, if you have any interest in that. I guess I can start with the second question, because that's uh, an area we have been working uh, with Goddard over the last eight or ten years to try to harmonize um, the work at at APL with the work at Goddard. And as David mentioned, they just recently stood up a working group at Glenn to kind of standardize or harmonize that across NASA. So, you know, since uh, CFE is being used in a wider community at, at Marshall and Johnson and Ames, um, you know, other organizations within NASA, um, that I think there is definitely movement to try to harmonize across, um, you know, not just individual projects or individual centers, but across NASA in general. Um, so I think that uh, JPL, in some ways, is in a kind of a unique situation because we um, started this effort. Uh, separately from CFE, CFS. So it's a, it's a completely different architecture. It's a completely different implementation. Um, while there are no efforts to bring Flight Software Core and CFE, CFS together, um, there is a tremendous amount of communication that happens between myself, Jonathan Wilmot, David, um, the NASA SARB, the Software Architecture Review Board, we're, we're all members of that board. Um, and so it, there's a lot of discussion and exchange of ideas about the different architectures, but they are, vi- they are completely different architectures. There are some fundamental principles that are different about them. Um, I forget what your other question was, though. Oh, how do you enforce the industry? Okay, so that was something that we definitely were interested in at JPL because, you know, part of this whole, like, idea of technology forecasting is to think, where is the future of flight software going? And gone are the days where you're going to have these huge in-house missions that only JPL will be writing the flight software for. Right? I mean, things are getting more expensive. They're becoming more distributed across different centers, across across uh, the planet, actually, across different um, 
space organizations. And so one of our driving requirements uh, was, was interoperability with other centers and, the, and distributed development. So actually built into our architecture is this idea of space and time partitioned components and an actual uh, sense of what a component is so that we can actually hand off the API to the flight software core and we can hand off that architecture description document to another uh, industry partner or center, and they can build a flight software component that's compliant with not only the flight software core, but the overall architecture. Now, have we tried this out? No, we have not tried it out yet. However, we believe that we have put the architectural constructs, the architectural principles in place such that in the future when this does happen, we will be able to do a collaboration to create a flight software system. So I'll speak as an industry user of uh, some common software. So Flight Software is also a make core competency within Lockheed. Um, so if we developed an internal capability like JPL would do, it would just be for our programs within them. So we're looking at leveraging really the work that, you know, the work the CFE, CFS, or if ultimately uh, JPL comes up with a baseline and we're able to leverage that, that would be excellent. So how, how can we, you know, build upon the community that exists already within NASA to go do this. And, um, but at the same point, we'd like to come to the table and understand our concerns, right, and what we'd actually like to see in that product. It's good to see that you're standing up, you know, a steering committee or something for that. How might, how might we influence, right, um, CFE 2.0 for the new capabilities that it needs to have? And um, definitely with the release of open source, restrictions come with that. So obviously when we get that code and we leverage it on our programs, right, there's certain restrictions that go along with it. Because if it's an internal product and you don't have those, then yes, you risk that um, somehow a program is going to take that baseline and open it up and make changes to it that risk its pedigree. Um, so um, definitely uh, looking at how we might leverage the capability that's coming out of NASA and, and expand the community. Okay, last question. Joel? Yeah. That's what software is. No, it's just in time. I, I'm mostly known as the Artems guy, but I'm also <laughs> the Army, uh, one of the Army representatives from Army Aviation on an open group effort for a reference architecture for cockpit software, which um, the thing they have, which you guys need to learn more about, I know you know about it because I know Goddard has heard about it, you might, uh, but they brought up a business group to go through the business pro processes of making it attractive for like Lockheed to actually sell reusable software components into the reference architecture. So there was actually a business case for doing it. They actually have gone to the trouble to do standard contract language, which has been through all of the lawyers for all the big primes so that every program doesn't have to go through the battle of putting how to comply to the architecture in their own contract language. Because so having done similar things in the past, solving the technical problem is one thing, but making it work business-wise and with the safety and security certifications is a completely different problem. And we're all generally decent at the technical side, but the business side we like to sh shove off and ignore. And Open Group FACE has done a lot of work on the business side. So, just And th this is FACE that you're talking about? Yeah, I'm yeah, and Lockheed, you know, and, and we looked at it a lot, I think, in, in some of the things to do. It's just, you know, the industry and definitely helicopters and cockpit stuff is much larger with the supplier base, right, that's not really there in space. So our challenge is, right, how do we stand up that type of capability or leverage what's been done, like auto SAR for the automotive industry leverage. or FACE? Leverage. Because you got, I mean, you got experience. Lockheed is a principal in FACE, too, so. Thank you. Okay, I want to I want to thank all of you. I think this was outstanding. This was a, a really nice discussion here. I, I I wish that there were more common ways to fund what you're doing from back home. So if anybody wants to go talk to the NASA director, we could. I think that'd be valuable. But I think the work you're doing, all of you, is just outstanding. Thank you.